All right, guys, uh, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Uh, we have a few people from the Historic Preservation Commission there at the bottom that don't have their videos turned on. They're just here to listen and be supportive. Um, the Historic Preservation Commission is delighted to host this panel discussion in lieu of hosting a walking tour in May for Historic Preservation Month. Um, oh, I guess I should have said, I'm Brie DeWitt, and I'm the chair of the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, and this was our way of outreaching to the community since we can't all get out and be together right now. Um, tonight, we're going to discuss the design for the new city hall and why the addition does not attempt to replicate the traditional design of the Common Pleas and the Carnegie Library. Um, our panelists tonight are uh, Joy Coleman. She's a preservation architect and principal with Trainer HO. Uh, Phil Penzel, who is the CEO of Penzel Construction. Dr. Stephen Hoffman, who's the coordinator of the Historic Preservation Program at Southeast Missouri State University. And Molly Maynard, did I say that correct? Molly? Uh, we're the city of St. Gerardo. Yes. So uh, the Historic Preservation Commission feels that it's important to educate the citizens about the why behind the design, especially in such an important building as our city, City Hall. So first we'll have Ms. Molly provide some insight into what led to the decision to move City Hall to Ivor Square and what expectations the city shared with the design team prior to the planning. So take it away, Molly. Great. Thank you, Bree. <laughs> And good evening, everyone. I want to spend just a few brief minutes going over the process of the city deciding to use the Common Pleas site as the future home for city. And it goes back a few years ago, uh, actually back to 2018, when the city selected uh, Chiodini Architects to actually conduct a space and needs assessment, uh, which included a review and evaluation of existing city facilities including our current city hall location, which is the old Warmer School, the Common Pleas Courthouse and Carnegie Library building, and the old police station on South Sprague Street. And some of the priorities for that study included making sure we have adequate space, security, and accessibility. And keep in mind, a few years ago when we started this process, our philosophy, our needs philosophy at the time was more of expansion for the future. So we were looking at a bigger footprint than what we currently have at the existing city hall. And for that reason, at that time, the Common Pleas Courthouse site was pre excluded pretty quickly because of the lack of adequate space. And quite frankly, there were some concerns about moving from one old building into an even old building. And so back then, the study that Kiyadidi did concluded that we should tear down the existing city hall and build a brand new building at that location. And that was for a price tag of about 19 to 20 million dollars. So in addition to the incredibly high price tag, uh, the council as well as several members of the public were not crazy about tearing down the old Warmer School either. And so while we were still reeling from sticker shock from that study, we were also grappling with the county's decision to leave the Common Police Courthouse. Um, many needed improvements to stabilize the building and trying to find an, um, a tenant or a user for that building that would hopefully even generate a revenue stream for the city. This was compounded by the fact that there's a deed restriction on the property that says the courthouse must be used for public use. So it soon became very apparent that it made very little sense to spend money to do something at the existing city hall site when we also had the huge responsibility of looking after the common police courthouse and the carnegie library buildings while this whole discussion is taking place the city was also facing the task of having to reinvent local government due to a pretty significant structural deficit in our budget our general fund and so we really took a step back and started to analyze how we provide services, how do we do things, how do we serve our customers, and is there a way to do things differently? And this also provided a different lens for the City Hall project. Can we do things differently? So given all of those factors, um, about a little over a year ago, we asked the architects to look at the Common Pleas and the Annex again, Carnegie Library again, with a budget ceiling of $12 million. 
So the architects proposed a solution that would utilize the two historic buildings with a new connecting piece in the middle. And this would accomplish our square footage requirements, um, accessibility, security, all of those things that we had identified as priorities. And we presented that concept to the Cape voters last summer. So in August of last summer, the Cape City voters approved the renewal of the capital improvement sales tax. And that is the funding source that is allowing us to move forward with this very important project. So shortly thereafter, the city issued a request for proposals for a design build team for the city hall project. And that's when we selected the Pencil Trainer HL team to bring this project to fruition. And some of the things that um, we communicated to the team that was very important to the city is honoring and respecting the history of that site. Um, the Common Police Courthouse is the most iconic building in all of Cape Girardeau, and it's critical to the city that we maintain um, that landmark status and, and make sure that we respect um, everything that has happened on that site. Um, but we also want to look to the future too and make sure that we're meeting the needs of the city moving forward. So I think that we really landed on a win-win um, situation here. We are going to preserve two landmark buildings, the Common Police Courthouse and the Carnegie Library. We're going to keep the seat of our local government in downtown Cape Girardeau. And we're going to meet all the needs that we had set out in the first place, the functionality, the accessibility, and the security. Um, and so I am incredibly excited. This is something that I have wanted to see come to fruition for a very long time. I know Dr. Hoffman and I would talk about it at Tunes at Twilight and um, talk about what could be. And so it's really exciting to see it finally come to fruition. And I'm really excited to um, have these professionals talk to you all this evening about the design philosophy moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Molly. Uh, I know that the panel and the commission was very excited to see that the city took um, such a direct approach to saving those two buildings, keeping things downtown, uh, definitely things that we support and stand for. So Phil, um, I know that you wanted to discuss how um, your company's history sort of ties to this project and some past uh, historic renovation that you've been involved in with Kate. Oh, Phil, you might be muted. It, it flashed at me. There you go. Now First of all, I want, to, I want to thank you all for allowing me to be part of this. Um, Molly, I've known and Joy, I know you've heard this before, but uh, uh, since we're talking about history, I thought I'd start out very briefly about our family history. Uh, back in 1853, my ancestors left Germany to find a new life in America. So they traveled up to Bremen, Bremen, Bremen Germany, and got on a Bremen ship, Ella, and sailed over to New Orleans in eight, uh, and landed there on November 7th. 1853. By the time they got out of the uh, uh, immigration and everything, they traveled up the Mississippi and landed in Cape Girardeau in January of 1854, which is the same year the Common Police Courthouse was built. So, you know, this has special meaning for me because that's one of the very first things that my ancestors saw when they landed in Cape Girardeau was the uh, Common Police Courthouse. Uh, I'm having technical issues here. Okay, never mind. That Joy, you're taking the screen, right? Or somebody is. Yes, Joy's working on it. Well, anyway, carrying on. When, when, whenever I found out the year that the courthouse was built, and, and it was the same year uh, that my ancestors arrived here in Cape County, uh, had special meaning to me. Um, and I wanted to definitely be part of this. 
back in about 2006 in, in that general area, we were asked to uh, do a historic renovation of the Southeast Missourian, which was built in 1924. And uh, uh, we were very excited to be part of that. That property is right across the street from this uh, common police courthouse. And we've had other historic projects in that general area, uh, including across the street from there, which was the uh, Presbyterian Church. We did a major renovation of it. And then my grandparent or my grandfather and my dad built the KFES tower across the street. So we have a lot of uh, family roots in that general area, and we are just excited beyond belief uh, to be part of this. And uh, I've always told people that ask me what my favorite project is, and uh, I could not leave the Southeast Missourian off the list. Uh, we actually were involved in a state award for historic preservation, and the Russ family invited me to go along with them to accept that award. Uh, I think it would be a tremendous goal of ours to do the same thing for this Common Pleas and Carnegie Library project. We're, we're very excited. Uh, we're, we're chomping at the bits to really get going on this. And there's a lot of history. We recognize that. I want to say one thing that uh, after it was published in the Missourian that we were awarded the project, I wanted to read something that, uh, that Stephen Limbaugh Sr. sent me in an email. And I think it puts everything in perspective. Of course, he congratulated me and he said, I am happy for you landing the business but I am also pleased that a company of your stature, stature and experience is doing the work. The preservation of the Common Pleas Courthouse is vital to the history of the community. It is rich in heritage and has a background so important to the preservation of our local judicial system. This is also true of the former library, which was a Carnegie gift when books and libraries were in demand. This is one of the most important jobs you and your company will ever have. And he's exactly right. And, and I don't take any of this lightly at all. This is uh, uh, a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. And we are honored to be part of it. I know when the commission got a chance to hear uh, Joy's vision and your connection to this project that it, we felt better about it before we even saw pictures because we can know that we were in good hands, we were in thoughtful hands, people who not only love historic preservation, um, but love downtown and love Cape Girardeau. And the more history you have with the city, the more you love it. So it's, it's good to be in good hands for sure. Uh, Joy, I love that you're already sharing some photos with us while we're getting a little bit of history. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your vision for this project? Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are also so excited to work on this project. This, for, for a preservationist, for a preservation architect, this is the dream. This is a dream project because we not only have a historic building on the National Register, we have another historic building not on the register, but in the Carnegie Library. And then we get to build something new beside those and connect them together and make them useful for another 150 years. So it's super exciting and it's also a little bit scary. It's a little bit intimidating because we have such history to work with. Um, we have such a large site and it's in such a prominent location in Cape Girardeau, up on the top of the hill. Boy, if you mess this one up, 
you know, <laughs> that's just, uh, there's, there's in this project. So um, what we do when we have a historic preservation project, and in particular, a, a project like this, where we have uh, multiple generations within one building and multiple buildings, um, all, and then also a new addition is we begin at the at what exists. We we begin at the beginning of the history of the site and review the National Register nomination, um, any history and development we can find of how the building was first constructed and how it changed over time and what is significant beyond the building itself. So the National Register nomination covers the entire site, which is the block um, and all the landscaping that you see. And included with the Common Pleas building as significant on, on this property is also the Spanish steps that run down to Spanish Street, the fountain on the west side of the building, the bandstand to the north, and then the small sundial that sits in between the Common Pleas and the Carnegie Library. So we pay special attention to those items uh, to be sure that our project does not negatively impact them and it restores and preserves as much as possible. So going into the, the buildings, um, we do what we refer to as a significant space diagram. And we kind of dissect what we see and the history that we can find. And we do these color-coded plans as the, as the result of this exercise and it helps us, the design team, um, focus on pr the preserving those most important elements and it also helps communicate with um, the reviewing entities and uh, the public and the subcontractors, everyone, what is important and what we need to preserve and maintain. So in this diagram, you'll see the dark red that's called very significant. Um, because of all the changes over time that this property has seen, we really see that significance reading on the exterior of the building. The next level, the significant level, um, that has to do with how much um, historic material has remained throughout the building. And um, unfortunately, the building, the Common Police building was changed uh, significantly in the 50s and perhaps before that. And so you'll see only one, one space in the orange and that's on the second floor of the original courtroom. Uh, the rest of the spaces um, are contributing. If they're yellow, that means they have a lot of this, the walls that were there, uh, that were built in the original construction or um, the most significant additions. And then the non-contributing spaces are support spaces or those areas that um, have changed greatly over time and were not that um, So then you ask how we made this determination. Well, we combed through all of the documentation that we could find on the, on the buildings and um, the quickly, you know, discovered that the main form, the main uh, body of the Common Police Courthouse was built in 1854 and that's the rectangular part in the middle that has the second floor courtroom. Um, and, and everything else was an addition. We had in 1888, um, the front porch was added, the uh, cupola and the tower, these small additions to the north and south and also to the west. And then in 1959, another addition was added to the west of that building. Now in 1922, the Carnegie Library was constructed and then it was added on to in 1959. And that's significant to us because the nomination when the building uh, property was put on the historic register, it was listed as being significant in spite of the addition to the Carnegie 
Carnegie Library in 1959 that so greatly changed the front facade of that building. Now, had that addition not been there, perhaps the Carnegie Library would have been declared significant on its own right or um, significant enough to contribute to the Common Pleas building's uh, history, historic significance. So um, this is a very, very important to us as a basis for beginning a project like this because one, we, we want to be sure to preserve the right um, items from the, uh, the older buildings, but we also want to very uh, delicately and um, respectfully build an addition that sits beside and um, not in front of the historic buildings. It needs to link the two together uh, functionally. And then also it needs to be of uh, a lesser importance when you view the addition from the outside. So this is the conceptual massing diagram that we came out of the design charrette with that tried to take all of those considerations and pull them together in a building and, and identify where we're going to put it and about how big it needed to be. So um, within the two buildings, you know, we have um, a document set that shows what items will be demolished and um, and what we saw very quickly walking through the buildings is that in the 1959 renovation, when the additions were added to the west of the Common Pleas and the north of the Carnegie Library, that a lot of the interior finishes were also changed. Um, and then that was why we designated a lot of those spaces as not very significant. Um, the exception to that would be on the second floor of both buildings. The second floor of the Common Pleas Courthouse has a lot of its original woodwork. So you can see the um, double door, you can see the casings around the windows, um, the, the chair rails are, I believe from the 1888 um, building campaign because they look to be in the style of an 1888 set of woodwork. Um, and then when we looked above the ceiling in that space, we saw a gorgeous plaster ceiling that's right now falling apart, but um, has you know great potential to be restored and return that, that room to what it was in that 1888 time period. The same can be said of the Carnegie Library second floor, although it is uh, more utilitarian and not quite as decorative, those items still remain in that building as well. Uh, so then how do we, you know, where do we go from here? Well, we need to design the exterior and we also have to think about parking. Um, the site, the parking on the site currently is not um, very useful. It's, it's falling apart a bit. So as part of this project, we are redoing the parking and um, building an underground parking garage. So our new addition, we wanna be very uh, sensitive to the original buildings. The foundations of the two buildings are soil bearing and they are uh, masonry. And so when you try to dig next to a masonry foundation, you're at risk of undermining that foundation. So we wanna make sure that our new addition stays away from the original building foundations. And so you'll see this new addition footprint uh, not getting very close to the basement. And then the, the uh, first floor of the new addition, we felt it very important that the council chamber be located here. Um, this is a city hall uh, for the city, it is a space that should be readily accessible and easy to get to and, and, and um, needs to be the right size. So that means that we decided it should be on the first floor of the new addition and the entry sequence 
to get into it should be very straightforward and um, link the parking lot with the um, courtyard on the north side around the fountain area. But what we saw from um, just being in town and talking with the building committee was that there are a lot of events that happen on that uh, west side of the common pleas around the, the fountain and the bandstand. Um, but we also needed to allow entry from the south side in the parking lot. So our vision would be that you would enter the building, you'd be able to enter in two places, one from the fountain side on the north and one from the south side at the parking lot. And if two people entered at the same time, then they would be able to see each other. There's um, a slight level change. It's uh, less than four feet between the two levels and um, a nice communicating stair right there we felt would do that for us. It would provide accessibility and it would link those levels together in a nice open way. And then when we get up to the second floor, um, this level is partially open to the public in the center, but then most of the spaces in the two older buildings would be uh, for the city staff. Of course, the exteriors of the two buildings would be restored. Um, they both use uh, a red brick, although it's not the same red brick. Um, it, and, and, and limestone, uh, we, you know, want to restore the, that masonry to a serviceable condition, um, touch up the paint and repair any problem areas on the cupola um, to make that, the older buildings last um, well into the future. So then what does the addition want to look like? Well, in elevation, um, we'll see that the addition is a different color, so we want to differentiate it, which is one of the Secretary of the Interior standards that Stephen will touch on in, in a bit. Um, and we want to make sure that it's um, separated from and lower than the most significant historic building, which is, of course, the Common Pleas Courthouse. So then when you start to look at the three-dimensional volume of the project, um, the most significant uh, facade of the Common Police Courthouse is the east facade looking up the Spanish steps. And we knew that this would be a very important view um, to preserve. And we also knew that the new addition would be visible in this view. So our goal with the design of the exterior of the chamber would be to make it prominent. Um, we didn't want it to compete with the historic building, but we wanted it to look um, like it, like it belonged. But it belonged, um, and as in a way that was readable as built in 2020 or uh, built in the 21st century. We did not feel like it should imitate the historic construction of any of the previous decades, but stand on its own. Um, from the fountain side, then you'll see that the new addition is much lower than the common police courthouse. Uh, the color is light, um, more matching or, or close to the stone color than it is the red brick. And where the building touches the Carnegie Library, it is also a lighter color and a bit, a bit smaller, a bit shorter. Then the entry piece is a different material altogether. It says 21st century and it says open and welcoming and it draws you in. Um, the, the window patterns then were the next thing to, to decide what to do with and um, we started very early on looking at the idea of using these regulating lines that are created by the heads of the windows, the bottom of the roof, the uh, window sills, and using those 
horizontal lines to create kind of a rhythm and a pattern in the new addition that responds to the historic buildings. And not only the common pleas, but also on the other side, uh, on the Carnegie side. And then the window that those regulating lines creates is, is proportionally um, similar to the building that it is closest to. On the south side, on the parking lot side, you'll really see the Carnegie Library and a, a hint and a bit of the Common Pleas Courthouse. Um, the chamber will be very prominent on the south side, as will the entry. It's our, our hope that we will have um, a bit of uh, public art um, involved or wanting to be involved in this project. And that is why we see the blank, kind of this blank spot on the wall um, to the east of the entry point. Um, so then one thing to keep in mind is uh, we aren't seeing the trees in this uh, rendered view set of drawings and those trees will still remain. Um, I believe there's a few that sit where the new building addition is being built, which will be removed, but the goal is to keep all the trees and also the um, stepped landscape that um, steps down to Spanish Street. So just a few of the details on uh, the, the design kind of began with this idea of a light touch that we want to be able to have the knowledge, at least that if this addition was removed in the future, that the historic building would not be uh, damaged or destroyed and could be returned to um, its original layout and format. And then one last uh, point about the um, garage piece. I, you hear garage and you think it's going to be you know, tall and, and it obtrusive. The goal of this garage is to replace the surface parking that is there today in about the same elevation and then to tuck underneath of that some staff parking and um, city hall vehicle parking. And now, I believe we'll hear from Stephen Hoffman. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Great, thank you, Troy. That was that was wonderful. Um, all right, let me see if I can share um, successfully, and um, and then still see you all. Um, Maybe adjust a few things here. All right. So um, <clears throat> good. Thank you. So I uh, wanted to kind of talk about the plans from a from a preservation perspective, and um, and you know I was um, tempted to um, to title this. Let's see if I can get my PowerPoint to to work here. There we go. I, I was tempted to, you know, do something like why you should like the design plans and, you know, because, you know, we're positive and, and, you know, and I certainly don't want to like tip my hand, you know, or anything. Um, but, but really, um, it's, it's not about that. It's not really about liking or not liking. It's, it's really trying to, um, uh, to determine whether um, we think these plans are appropriate for what we're trying to accomplish um, in the City Hall um, project uh, involving the Court of Common Pleas and the um, Carnegie uh, Library. And of course, um, what we're trying to accomplish is to take these historic buildings and to um, repurpose them um, so that they um, are able to uh, function uh, well 
um, uh, as a 21st century uh, building and, and to, to make um, uh, kind of the, the city hall operation uh, be the best that it can be um, in an appropriate space for um, the 21st century and doing it in the context of, of these historic uh, buildings. So um, what we're doing is called rehabilitation, right? We're gonna rehabilitate the existing structures and we're going to um, uh, uh, add a, a new connecting uh, building um, so that we can have a, a, a truly uh, world-class um, 21st century city hall. So it's not a restoration. We're not going back to what it used to be, um, but really just trying to put them uh, into service uh, for today's uses. And, and so um, in order to decide whether this is an appropriate um, a kind of design or not, um, I think we should look to the Secretary of Interior Standards uh, for Rehabilitation. They're kind of the, um, the philosophical underpinning for um, how we approach uh, preservation projects. Um, they're, they're the standards that are used if you know, we were doing a tax credit a rehabilitation project. Um, I think that uh, given the significance of these buildings, this is kind of the philosophical approach and standards that um, we want to use. And so I'm just going to kind of quickly um, go through them. Um, and, and so the goal is really to have a sense of, okay, these are the standards. These are, this is the lens that we should use to determine whether we think this is appropriate or not. Um, and if we do think it is appropriate, um, then, I, then I think we can say, this is good. This is a really good project. Um, and I like it because it's a nice, appropriate um, treatment. So the first standard is that property should be used um, uh, as it was uh, historically or given a new use that requires a minimal change. Um, uh, standard two, uh, historic character of a property should be retained um, and preserved. Um, you know, don't remove um, character defining features. The third um, a standard is to recognize that properties change over time. Um, and so there are, um, uh, each property will be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use. Um, and so you don't want to create a false sense of historical development. You don't want to add uh, a conjectural features. You don't want to fool people into thinking something is historical uh, when it's not. Um, changes to a property that have acquired historic significance um, uh, should be retained and preserved. Um, distinctive materials, finishes, um, and construction techniques, and craftsmanship, evidence of craftsmanship should, um, uh, that help determine character should be preserved. Um, the um, standard number six is really, it's better to repair than replace. And so if it's deteriorated, try to do that, but replace in kind. Um, Number seven has to do with um, kind of physical treatments. Um, and so you don't want to damage historic materials uh, in the process of a rehabilitation. Um, standard eight has to do with the archaeological resources um, in the area. Um, nine and 10 are something we'll be looking at uh, for sure, right? New additions um, should not destroy uh, historic materials or spatial relationships. The new work should be differentiated uh, from the old, Joy kind of made a reference to that um, uh, earlier. Um, they should be differentiated, but they should be compatible in terms of materials, feature size, scale, and proportion, um, and massing. Um, and, um, and number 10, um, uh, new construction and additions should be undertaken in such a manner, manner that if they were to be removed, um, that you, know, you would still, in essence, have the original um, building. Um, and so, you know, standard number one, I, I think, you know, right out of the box, you know, we're doing great. You know, where was City Hall before it moved into the Lorimer School that it currently occupies? It was in the Court of Common Pleas, right? So this is City Hall is, is, is going home. City offices are going back uh, to a building um, that my understanding is city offices have been in there um, since the 1850s, that there's always been a, a, a city presence. Don't, don't quote me on that, but it goes back as far as I could, I could find. Um, uh, and uh, certainly the library was not city hall, but um, having city offices in there, you know, certainly is, a, is an appropriate um, use of that. So I think this project is fully in keeping uh, with the first standard. Um, the historical character being retained and preserved, um, I, I think we got a sense 
from Joy's uh, presentation um, and I think Phil's uh, comments as well um, that I have a, a high degree of confidence that um, that this plan takes into account the historic character um, and uh, and uh, is is aimed to preserve as much of the distinct materials um, as as possible while while still putting it into a um, uh, into a modern use. Um, when we look at three and four, um, you know, this starts to kind of get into the weeds a, a little bit, right? That um, each property should be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use. Um, we don't want to create a false sense of historical development. Um, and, and some changes um, acquire historical significance um, in their own right, right? We're not going back to the original, but, but some of the historical changes are historical uh, in and of themselves. And so when you look at the design plan and, and all, all of my drawings and everything, um, uh, Joy was kind enough to share um, the uh, PDFs of a lot of the images she used. And, and so I just cut and pasted them uh, into my presentation. And so, um, so the credit all goes uh, to the architects, um, but um, I thought it would be the best way to, to really talk about it. So, um, so looking at, um, uh, you know, at, at this view, we can see that, um, that there were changes that happened to the library um, that um, that are that are no longer there, right? Um, the removing of the addition is this something that um, is in keeping, you know, with the standards? Is this a, a, a good change? Um, the uh, the library addition um, was. Um, um, uh, dates to 1959, um, so it's certainly old enough to be historic. Um, it was designed by one of uh, Cape Girardeau's, um, uh, probably one of the, the most significant um, 20th century architects in Cape Girardeau, certainly most significant of the second half of the, um, of the 20th century, which is uh, where this um, uh, edition uh, dates uh, from. Um, and uh, you know, and that's going to be taken away. And no matter, you know, how you, whether you like it, you know, um, or not, whether you love the mid-century modern or not, um, you know, it, it, it is there. Um, and what's the um, effect of removing it? Well, Joy um, uh, did mention uh, earlier that, um, uh, that when this property, the Court of Common Pleas, was placed on the National Register, um, we tried to argue that the Carnegie Library um, was uh, significant and contributing. Um, and, um, and the ruling from the keeper of the National Register was that, because it went all the way up the chain, uh, was that no, um, this non-historic edition um, uh, uh, meant that the Carnegie Library um, could not be a contributing uh, property. So, um, so really, in terms of um, standard uh, three and four, um, you know, as we look at it, this is not an addition that has taken on historic significance in its own right. And so removing it um, is certainly a completely uh, appropriate thing uh, for us to do. And so, um, you know, as we look at um, the Carnegie Library facade, um, and what the plans are for that and the removal of the 1959 Boardman edition, um, you know, we can say with clarity that, you know, we're fully meeting standards one, two, three, and four. So, I mean, we are, um, uh, we are in good shape uh, here uh, with this um, uh, edition. Now, as we move on to uh, standard five, uh, distinctive materials, features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize a property will be preserved. So if we're looking at the Carnegie Library and we think about what is it that gives this property its character, um, it really is the, um, the window patterns, the, um, what would have been the, the door opening. Um, and that is all um, uh, retained. And even though um, that central entrance in the uh, Carnegie Library, as I understand it, is not going to be an active doorway, um, it still reads as, um, uh, as, a, as an opening. And the, the um, modular pattern Joy talked about, they, they 
spend a lot of care on the, the window treatments and thinking about how to do that, um, sort of the, the glass uh, elements. And, and so that very much um, is, is, is modern and 21st century opening. You can tell that um, it has been rehabilitated, um, but it really does it in a way that um, preserves that um, character of what, the, what made the Carnegie Library what it is. So um, I think if we're looking at it through the lens of the standards, um, that it, it certainly is in keeping with um, standard uh, five. Um, so, um, so I'm definitely on board with um, what the proposal um, uh, is for the Carnegie Library. Um, I remember uh, Molly talked about our numerous conversations uh, during Tunes at Twilight about the future of the courthouse and the, the library. And I remember that day, I was like, Molly, do you think maybe it's possible we could you know, take off that edition someday? So I'm you know, very excited. Um, but again, it's not what I like. Um, it's about what's appropriate. Um, and and the, the plan um, is very appropriate and very uh, much in keeping preservation standards. Um, if we turn our attention to the to the new edition, um, so then the, um, you know, the, the, so this is the building that really is connecting um, these two um, historic uh, buildings that, um, again, we want to look and say, okay, um, it's, it's, it's not a question of whether um, whether you like it, you know, do you, do you like postmodern design or do you like something more historical? Um, but, but really what I think we need to do um, is, is to look at it in terms of what's best preservation practice. Um, I think that sometimes people will um, kind of first look at this and, and their, um, uh, their um, response might be, it should be red brick, right? You've got these two red brick buildings. If you're going to add something, certainly you should add, it should be in, in red brick. Um, uh, and, um, and I think that, that the architects made a, um, made a wise choice in not, uh, not going in, in, in that uh, direction. Um, in part, uh, the lighter color um, kind of helps, um, helps maintain uh, a visual sense that, that these are three parts that have been uh, put together um, and that they are in relationship to, to each other, um, but, but it doesn't come off as just one big lump. Um, which I think would be um, the danger of trying to do something in red brick is that it would just um, uh, kind of, you know, it would be it would be hard to um, uh, to, to visually discern the the three different um, elements. Um, but again, it's not what I think, you know, or what I like. Um, you know, really is well. Let's think about um, the standards and use the standards as a lens for determining whether. Um, this is an appropriate way to, um, to approach uh, the design or not. And, and here really, um, uh, we're looking at standards nine and, and 10, um, where we're talking about uh, new additions. And so, um, uh, you know, in thinking about um, number nine, um, uh, the standard is that the new work should be differentiated from the old, right? The, um, uh, the goal is not to, um, not to fool anybody, right? That um, that that this is, you know, a, a, an, an extension. And so, if this were a red brick um, uh, addition, um, it 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 would be harder to to kind of have that um, uh, that sense of of differentiation. But you, you can walk here, and you can immediately see um, uh, three periods of historical development. Um, uh, including the, the 21st century. And, and so I think that is um, an appropriate um, goal. It, it, it really reads as three buildings from uh, three uh, different times. Um, uh, Standard nine also says that the, um, that the addition should be compatible um, in terms of materials, feature, size, scale, and proportion and, and massing. And so looking at the design drawings again, and, and again, you could say, aha, compatible historic materials, it should be brick. It's like, well, no, you know, um, uh, given the need to differentiate um, and thinking about all the elements of what it means to be um, compatible, um, 
uh, you know, it's more than just, um, you know, the, the color of, of the brick. And, and um, there are, are generally three design uh, perspectives that, 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 um, uh, that designers can take um, in terms of, you know, do you try to match what's there? Do you try to create something um, that is uh, contrasting? Um, you know, think of the glass pyramid at the Louvre as something that, right, is, is just, you know, a, a contrasting uh, kind of element. Um, and, and good preservation practice um, really leans toward um, something that is, is compatible. And so looking at what the materials are. And so picking up on the, the light um, stone uh, of, the, of the limestone and, and, and going with, with that, focusing on um, you know, here the, the size and the scale and the massing um, are, are very uh, compatible. Um, you know, we have uh, both kind of the continuation of a level skyline, but um, some vertical elements uh, in that entrance. And so that um, uh, the new addition is able to kind of speak to both um, of the historic buildings uh, there uh, in, a, in a compatible um, fashion. And, and so, um, so it's differentiated, but it's not contrasting. It's, it's very um, uh, compatible. Um, if, if we look at it from um, kind of the, from the front, from the, from the riverside, um, I think that, you know, here um, it's, it's uh, um, uh, the, um, the size, the scale, the, the massing are such that the new addition is clearly subservient. So the goal here, um, as Joy said, was to, was to not um, overpower or, or take away from um, the, the view of the, of the courthouse building. And, and so by having a kind of a smaller um, footprint, um, but maintaining that sort of uh, modularity, um, I think it, it really um, uh, achieves that um, very, very well. The, um, you know, in terms of, uh, um, let me see, I'm trying, there we go. In terms of, you know, some of the design um, elements, um, and, and this came out in, in Joyce's presentation um, as well, I'm trying to, to use um, uh, horizontal line, existing horizontal lines to, to help inform the, um, the design of, of the new building. And I think even kind of the, the modular pattern, on the one hand, you've got this beautiful 21st century um, uh, glass transparent uh, space that, um, uh, you know, um, makes the building itself lighter so that it, it doesn't uh, pull attention away from the, from the historic building, uh, but doing it kind of in a modular fashion so that it picks up on uh, the window uh, pattern uh, that, it, that exists. So, um, uh, you know, it really is um, uh, very nicely done. And you start looking at the different design elements and you can see where um, the designers have really worked hard to find um, elements of compatibility and, and so that the new construction can relate um, uh, uh, very positively and in a reinforcing fashion uh, to uh, the existing building. Um, and, you know, I think we see that uh, also in the, in the view uh, from the south, um, the, the, the scale, the size, the proportions, the, the, the matching, the massing rather. Um, so when you look at it, you very much know this is a 21st century building, um, but it fits in. Um, it's compatible um, and is, is kind of a comfortable um, uh, relationship uh, with the, um, both the, the courthouse and the um, and the library, which again are built in different time periods, and 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 so that's um, it's it's a pretty tricky feat to be able to 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 give nods to to both of them, um, and I think to to try to do it in a in a connective way, um, uh, and I think that they've done a nice um, job uh, with that. So. Um, so standard nine uh, seems like we, we were really paying attention to that. Standard ten um, is, uh, and Joy mentioned this, 
um, that new additions should be constructed so that if they're ever removed, uh, the essential form and integrity of the original properties would, um, would be unimpaired. Um, and so if you look at the way uh, Joy mentioned having a light touch and connecting uh, the buildings, and if, if you look um, at the way that this been, has been accomplished, I, I think it really does um, a nice job, and particularly with the, um, with the courthouse, that the, the new addition um, is, is um, set back. So there's some nice separation there. Um, and you know, so we're just connecting it here um, on the end. Um, we have um, this uh, kind of an exterior courtyard, you know, so we're just connecting to the, uh, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Uh-oh, going the wrong way. Um, we're just connecting to the, um, to the courthouse here um, and here, um, and then of course on, on this side. And all of those um, connections are, are fairly um, light. If, if we look at the, this, I didn't want to show this first because it, it's, it's fairly busy. Um, and again, these I, I just took off of the, um, the architect's uh, plans. Um, and um, I think these might even be some existing uh, openings that the architects are, are, are using um, here um, and here. So very light touches on the courthouse um, and really um, also very light touches here with the um, uh, with the with the library, and so when you look at the design drawings, you see there's clear separation. Um, so we've really differentiated, you know, by um, by not coming flush with that wall, but having that indentation allows for that separation, but also allows for that light touch. Um, and then here with the library, again, the the same kind of, of thing. So um, so if you're um, thinking about which none of us are, but if you're ever thinking about removing this 21st century edition, if at some point in the future we want to restore um, the courthouse, um, we, we could remove that um, uh, and, and, and not have really damaged the or, original building. It's a very respectful um, kind of, of, of addition. Um, and while achieving that goal, um, I think the design also um, stands as its own as a 21st century uh, contribution, right? We want, um, uh, as Joy said in her presentation, right? This is, um, you know, for the next 150 years, right, of, of, the, of having this building, um, these buildings uh, serve, uh, continue to serve the public. So, you know, in looking at the, um, uh, the standards, um, you know, we clearly meet standard one in terms of the historical use. Um, uh, the designs clearly are um, uh, preserving um, the historic character of the existing uh, properties. Um, uh, we're, we're respecting uh, the, the physical record um, that's there. We're not adding anything conjectural. We're not pretending that somehow these are all um, combined uh, together at some point in the past with some sort of historical connecting um, uh, element, but rather we're, we're differentiating that, right? We're respecting each um, for its own physical uh, time, place, and use. Um, the, the elements that have acquired historical significance, we're preserving, we're removing those that did not uh, achieve historic uh, significance. Um, the distinctive characteristics that define these buildings um, are being preserved. Um, in terms of, I don't have a check mark for, for six, because a lot of that is going to be in the doing, um, but based on the presentation um, from both the architect um, and, the, um, and the construction firm, I have a strong sense that there's a lot of attention being paid um, to that. Um, and, um, but it, the ones that I've really focused on in terms of being able to look at the plans, um, uh, we clearly meet um, standards um, nine and, and 10. So um, overall, you know, we look at this plan um, through the historic preservationist lens of the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation. Um, I think that this is a good design um, and it accomplishes the, um, the things that we would want to accomplish uh, with these very important and significant 
um, historic buildings uh, for the community. Um, I think that, you know, that this design accomplishes them well. Um, and, um, and I think that gives us every reason um, to, to like them because they're doing what they're supposed to do and they're doing it really well. So that's, that's kind of my look at the plans through the lens of preservation. Um, and then, you know, if there are any questions. Uh, we did have we did have a few questions um, that we put out a call to the public asking if anyone had any questions and I have just a few a lot of these things you excellent panelists have already covered um, I'm gonna stop sharing okay that's right there we go I liked your question background though I thought that was a great oh I, I could share it again if you want no it, it's okay I, I just thought it was really really well planned um, so a question that um, that we've got, and that I know that I've heard from other people who've asked me about the project, does this impact the National Register listing in any way? Will there have to be notes made for that register? How will that work? So I guess there are a couple of ways to answer it. And, and so the, the, the clearest one is, you know, that the National Re being listed in the National Register doesn't really control what we can do. Um, I think that um, kind of given, you know, you know, my analysis, I think that, um, that we are retaining um, the uh, character defining features that convey its significance and so that it is in no danger of being delisted. Um, I, I just, I just wouldn't see that at, at all. Um, in fact, I, you know, I'm thinking um, that, and I'd be curious to, to kind of see what, what Joy thinks, but um, that, you know, when we, when we move through this, you know, trying to see if we can amend the National Register um, to have the Carnegie Library included as a contributing resource instead of a non-contributing resource, um, because I think that um, the, the non-historic edition that, um, that made it not, not contributing will be removed. And it seems to me that the, the, the proposed treatment um, is, um, is in keeping with the Secretary of Interior Standards. And, and so actually we might be able to kind of get an enhanced, more robust um, uh, listing is, is kind of my, my perspective. So I think it helps rather than hurts. Do you agree with yeah, that? Yeah, that was our thought. Yes, yes, that was our thought too, that removing the North edition on the Carnegie would allow in the future the Carnegie to be listed as a contributing uh, building to the Common Pleas property. Awesome. Uh, so maybe someone knows something I don't know, but I have the question, does the skewed entrance symbolize anything? Oh, yes, we have had uh, some questions about the skewed entrance. So we were trying to do a few things. Um, I talked about the double sided entry and wanting to be able to enter from the north side and the south side and have that visual connection of someone at the north to down at the south. And that's because it's, you know, it's a public building and, and uh, wayfinding is important. And when you enter into one door, it needs to be obvious where you go next. So if you're coming from the parking lot, uh, you want to know how to get to the chamber or the, the permit desk if you're coming from uh, the, the fountain side. And so we, we shredded this project in January, which means we looked at a lot of different design options. And um, that goal was always there and it was always something we were trying to achieve. And so because it was a goal, every, every design I think had some kind of a two-sided entry that, um, that had steps and an elevator that, that allowed people to move through and, and also maintain the openness. Um, we couldn't get it to work in a straight line. We tried, uh, it, it looked clunky. It didn't work very well. And so we stepped out of the building and we took a walk around. <laughs> this is what we do during design charrettes is you just kind of have to get out of your head a little bit. 
And when we were walking around, we were standing by the fountain and looking at the gorgeous view, which was an, another goal of the addition is to capture the views and, um, and let the new spaces within the building see the river and see over downtown um, and see the bridge. And so when we were standing up there at the fountain looking towards the river, uh, we noticed that we were, our, our view was skewed. We were not looking directly south in line with the wall of the Carnegie, but we were looking um, towards the bridge. So we went, went back inside and uh, did some measurements and some calculations and found that that angle was about 20 degrees off of straight south. And so we took uh, one design plan that the committee liked. We took another one um, that we also liked and we overlaid them. And the only difference really was the skewing of the entry. And so we worked that into the plan. And um, so it's basically the, the view from the fountain to the bridge. Awesome. Can I add uh, something to this? Absolutely. Uh, one, one thing that we're all forgetting is the Carnegie Library floor elevations and the um, eleva uh, floor elevations of the Common Police Courthouse were not at the same levels. So that added a lot more challenges on getting the steps and everything laid out correctly. Uh, and I think it, uh, with what we had to work with, in some cases there were six foot of difference. Uh, so what we had to work with was amazing that we could uh, uh, come up with this type of plan. And, and Joy already mentioned this about the view downtown and the view towards the river bridge. But we, when you're in the council chambers, that's where everything's gonna really shine. You're gonna be able to look out the windows and look downtown where everything started. And then you look out the side windows and you'll be able to see the new river bridge. Uh, I think it's gonna be spectacular. Um, we'll look at some other stuff we've got here too. Oh, um, I know you, you touched on this a little bit, but just to clarify, so will any of the monuments um, or pieces in the, in the courtyard be lost? No, none will be lost. There will be a few that are moved um, from where they sit right now, um, but they'll all be maintained. Now, a few of them are pretty close to access points or um, layback of the excavation for the addition. So we'll want to pick those up and put them in storage uh, during the project and then bring them back and set them down, uh, set them back down. So uh, we might, you know, public might see some of those monuments being removed for a short time, but they will come back. Okay. Uh, another one we have that's a popular question is what's the timeline for construction? Yeah, so the timeline for construction is coming up pretty quick. Um, we have submitted our garage package drawings first, um, which will allow us to start the excavation and, and the construction of the garage. And then as that garage starts to go up in um, a July or so, we'll start um, doing demolition on the Carnegie building and um, abatement inside the buildings. And then in August or uh, September, I can't remember exactly, then we'll start um, the large excavation for the addition. And then it will all be wrapped up in, um, at the end of the summer, beginning of fall in 2021. So this was my favorite question. And uh, I'd like to hear from a couple of you, what do you hope people will say about this addition and City Hall being there 50 years from now? I think I want to hear what Molly has to say. <laughs> <laughs> I hope in 50 years that the citizens of Cape Girardeau say, I'm so glad they, they made 
decision so long ago because um, it was the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, rather than letting the courthouse sit there and, and not really have any um, certainty, I think, I think the future generation will thank us for our investment in, in these buildings. And, um, and I hope that they will continue to take pictures on the courthouse steps for, for generations to come. So that's what I hope. I would say kind of from a historic preservation point of view, a lot of times, you know, preservationists get, you know, pegged as like, oh, we just want to keep everything old and we don't want anything new. Um, and, and that's not true. I mean, I think we want to keep, you know, the best of, of what's old. And, and I think that, you know, the, um, you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. And, you know, that this is, as Phyllis said, this is, you know, where the community started. And, you know, so I think our historic buildings are really important uh, to our identity. Um, but I think it is important um, to, in the present day, um, to build for, um, build buildings that, that we want to preserve. And I think that I'm really excited in terms of the, um, the care that's going into this project that, you know, this is not, you know, a building that's being built to have a lifespan of 20 years and then, you know, we depreciate it and tear it down and build something new. This, this is a, a generational project and, and that, you know, we're building something that we're going to want to preserve um, in 50 years and that we're going to be proud of our community, as Molly said, um, for doing the right thing. Um, in in 2020 and and kind of um, you know making an investment in community um, by having a quality space um, as our um, as our city hall and and kind of preserving the best of the past um, and building um, uh, for the future um, buildings that that are going to be worth preserving so that's what I hope people recognize I hope it doesn't take 50 years for them to recognize it but even in 50 years I hope they still do recognize that I hope that uh, people see this as a heartwarming project that it is. When I hear everyone talk about it, it, it has all the things that I think of when I think of Cape. It's, it's downtown, it's community, it's preserving our history, the idea of tying in public art now has me excited. And it's, it's just all the things that I love about Cape. So like Steve said, I hope it doesn't take 50 years. I hope it's built and people go to tunes and they see that and they're proud of it and that they're proud to be in our community that's focused on those things. Um, but in 50 years from now, I hope they still see it as, as this awesome heartwarming thing that, that the community did to keep the structure alive and to, and to keep our city offices downtown. I think that's awesome too. Yeah. I, I just want to say, I really appreciate the presentation and uh, I think the explanation of why the modern is not in a brick color. I, that's what I've heard from a number of people was a concern about that. I think when that is explained to everyone, um, I think it makes a lot of sense. So I, I'm impressed with it. Does anybody else have anything they wanna add before we finish tonight? All right, well, I wanna, I wanna thank every, oh, do you have something, Steve? I was going to, I was going to, I was going to, you know, we're, we're wrapping it up. It is kind of a community feel good moment. And, and really to, okay. to thank Molly for, um, for, um, you know, really, um, uh, you know, not giving up and finding a way um, to, to, to make this project happen. I mean, I think it is a really, it's a really good thing um, that our community is doing. And it, it took us a while to figure that out. Um, and I think persistence, um, uh, paid off uh, there, um, and and I think that you know again hiring um, Joy and and Phil that you know when when you do a big project like this I mean it's like oh I have this idea and then the execution of it is in somebody else's hands and I think that the execution has been done um, you know excellently I mean I think we have really good. Um, good set of plans and a good a good direction to go and I think a project that we're going to be um, proud of and and it doesn't um, that doesn't happen by accident and and so um, so I really appreciate um, everybody uh, who's engaged and involved uh, in that and and then Bree thank you for having the Historic Preservation Commission 
uh, put this panel together because I think um, this is really, you know, Im important stuff. And, and I think that, um, uh, as Mark indicated, the more you understand about design and the more you understand about what we're really trying to do, I think the better, um, the, you know, the better the plans um, appear. So. Yeah, Steve took the words out of my mouth, Bree. I wanted to thank you uh, for organizing this panel and to the entire Historic Preservation Commission for your service. Um, you do such great work for our community, uh, often behind the scenes that people don't see the great work that you all do. So I do want to um, extend a very sincere thank you for all that you do and, um, and look forward to, to doing more with you in the future. Oh, well, thanks. I wish uh, we could all be physically together right now, but this, this is a good alternative, I guess. Does anybody else have anything they want to add? No, I thank uh, everybody for putting this together and inviting me. And uh, I, I really am excited to be part of it. And, and uh, I really appreciate what everybody has to do to contribute to this. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a community effort. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.